So it's a great pleasure to have next to me here uh, Joel Cohen. Uh, Joel and I met about uh, 10 plus years ago, I want to say, and uh, works with MIT's uh, endowment. Uh, we'll talk about MIT a little bit later. Um, what impressed me the most about MIT is, you know, it's one of the largest endowments, obviously one of the largest in universities in the world. And I intuitively thought the larger the uh, investment company, the, the larger the manager uh, they would orientate themselves to. Do, to. But MIT was really, was and is the opposite. Uh, they were the first uh, institutional investor to ever uh, reach out to me, to spend the time, to come and visit me, to, to hear about how I invest. And I was incredibly impressed then, and everything I've experienced um, in the 10 years since has, uh, has impressed me even more. Um, so it's great to have you here, Joel. We we'll talk about MIT, but what we would all love to hear about first is Joel. So tell us your origin story. Sure, yeah, um, well first, thank you for having me. It's a great honor to, to be here. It's a fantastic event, really a unique setting and a unique group of people and a unique topic, I think, as well. Um, and it's fun to, to be able to contribute in some way. Um, so I've been with MIT for 12 years. Um, I joined right out of college. Um, you know, you're a lifer then. Yeah, I, I, uh, it's been my only job. Um, and I think I kind of, wrestled with what I wanted to do when I was in college and when, how do I want to spend my Were life. Were you also in college at MIT? Or did no, I didn't go to, to MIT. I went to Brown. Um, right. So I was kind of familiar with the Northeast, but uh, not so much MIT. And I, I found my way there just because I was sort of looking around at what would be an interesting career. You know, where do I want to be in, in 10, 15, 20 years? Um, and I knew a few of the ingredients. I sort of figured out um, I'd had a little bit of exposure to investing from classes that I took in college, you know, really in, in a more academic way, um, but enough to know this was an intriguing field, but that I didn't know exactly where in there I wanted to be. Um, so I knew that was, you know, one piece of the puzzle. And then um, I knew that I wanted to, to work for some higher purpose, that I wanted to do not just interesting work, but, you know, do it on behalf of, um, you know, some, some cause that mattered to me um, that would kind of give me extra motivation every day. Um, but those are two very kind of general things. And so I, I looked really wide uh, at different places and and one of the things I stumbled across was endowments uh, that they have these large pools of capital that they invest all over the world in all sorts of different asset classes and you know they directly support the, the mission of their institutions and I thought that sounds like an amazing place to be you know maybe I can do that in 10 or 15 years um, and I, you know figured why would they hire someone right out of school when uh, they can hire someone who actually knows what they're doing uh, but I did discover that some of the larger institutions will actually hire people right out of school and kind of train them uh, and so I thought well that sounds even more amazing like what an incredible place to learn the investment business to get exposure to uh, you know interesting people different um, you know asset classes and strategies all over the world um, and to be part of MIT and to continue to kind of be on a, on a college campus um, and so that was 12 years ago, and, and I knew that, you know, there was a potential that it would be something I would do for a really long time. Um, but here I sit kind of 12 years later, and, and it's just been an amazing experience and an amazing place to learn. Uh, it continues to be incredibly fun, so I wouldn't be at all surprised if I'm still sitting here in another 12 years uh, doing the same thing. Yeah. You're a passionate value investor. Were there any, who were, who were the sort of role models, or where did you... What was what was the kind of the trigger moment or the aha moment when you figured, okay, this is this is the way I think people should invest, and this is what I'm going to look for in other people? Yeah, I think it, it really didn't come until after I started at MIT uh, that I, you know, I really hadn't even had much exposure to value investing before that. Um, so it was just in being at MIT, and you know, suddenly, you know, you have access to all of MIT's investment firms that we work with, and. You know, your job is to go out and find amazing people for MIT to partner with. And so it was really managers that we've gotten to know through that process that have become um, kind of inspirational, um, you know, at first a little bit from afar. And then as I've, you know, gained more experience, there were managers that I would meet and, and I would be the one uh, kind of championing the, the investment process and get a chance to build a direct relationship with people um, whose investment work I really respected. Um, it's almost like an apprenticeship. It was through seeing different types of managers. You sort of slowly were able to form your opinion on what you liked and probably also disliked. Yeah, for sure. And I think MIT has, you know, we have our own 
subset of managers that we tend to gravitate towards. We're not trying to you know, be experts at every single kind of investing all over the world. So I think there's a strong grounding of kind of bottom up value investing. Um, but then I think if you do this for a long time, you start to kind of find the types of things that you personally gravitate towards. Um, and you know, MIT invests in a lot of different types of firms and strategy. There's, there's public managers and private managers, venture capital, real estate, and all those sorts of things. Um, but I think I found myself really gravitating towards kind of long-term uh, stock picking, um, you know, sort of one and two person shops, um, owning, you know, great companies for long periods of time, um, just as such a proven strategy over time. And it really works in my head. And I think one of MIT's big competitive advantages is having the patience to see those kinds of strategies through um, and withstand the volatility along the way. So, um, you know, not only does it really resonate with me, but it plays to one of MIT's biggest competitive advantages in the market as well. Yeah, the, the long-term patient capital. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, you mentioned the sort of the the, the 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 concept of mission and the purpose of the endowment was a big motivation for you. Maybe a few words about um, MIT and, and the mission. Yeah, so um, so we manage all the financial assets of of MIT, um, and it's a it's a big source of. Um, of, uh, it's a big contributor to the operating budget every year. I think somewhere between 25 and 30% of what MIT spends every year comes from the endowment. So uh, it's really critical that we get do our job right and, and make good investments um, over time and um, you know, hopefully grow at a faster rate than our spending so that MIT can spend even more money on all the problems that it's trying to solve for the world and you know, spend more money supporting the student community and uh, the research that's going on at MIT. Um, so it's it's really special to see that direct link uh, between our work and and what happens at MIT, um, and you know basically the strategy that we have is is we try to go out and find the best investment firms all over the world. You know the best way to compound MIT's capital is to partner with the best investment firms who can compound at above average rates for really long periods of time, and so. We've really organized our entire investment process around finding and partnering with those special types of firms. Um, you know, we've tried, sort of tried to cast out some of the things that got between us and that mission. Um, we used to have sort of a top-down asset allocation, like many institutions do, where we would say, you know, we want to have 10% in domestic equities and and 20% in private equities and 10% in emerging markets equities, and so on. Um, and we found that that didn't make us better manager investors. It didn't make us better investors, and we didn't feel like that was anything that we had a competitive advantage in. So we said, you know, let's let's work bottom up. Let's focus on just finding uh, these amazing people that we can work with, and let's not try to bucket them. You know, some of the most amazing firms actually don't fit into any bucket. Maybe they invest publicly and privately, and um, you know, maybe they um, they take some approach from private markets and apply it to public markets or what have you. Um, and so we just wanted to um, evolve our process to try and do more of what we thought we were the best at. Um, so we've you know, changed to be much more bottom up uh, with no sort of asset class yeah. uh, targets of any kind. It's a fascinating idea because I, I see a parallel in investing. Often the very best types of companies are the ones which are difficult to really put into a particular bucket. They're not they're kind of a pharmaceutical company, but also consumer goods, or they, they kind of straddle different different uh, things. So it's interesting you see that parallel there. Obviously, uh, manager selection is a big part of your work. Um, but what I also see you do is also try and expand the pool of um, potential managers. Um, and you have the initiative for, for emerging managers. So maybe you can, you can talk a little bit about that. Sure. Yeah, I think, um, you know, the, the evolution that we had towards partnering with emerging managers and working with emerging managers was kind of a, a natural organic one that started about 10 years ago. Um, and it really wasn't a top down plan. We're going to suddenly start, you know, we're going to have an emerging manager program and we're going to partner with, you know, 50 emerging managers or something like that. It was, you know, in the course of being out at uh, different events, we would meet really interesting people um, that we thought were you know, headed somewhere really interesting and doing something different and unconventional, but, you know, they were, you know, uh, just getting started. They didn't have a track record. Maybe they were really young, um, but they just seemed like the kind of people, if your goal is to partner with the best people, they just seemed like people we should partner with. Um, and so it really happened bottom up. We started meeting people that we thought we should be in business with. And so we sort of created a framework around that goal uh, to start working with emerging managers. 
um, you know, without any kind of a uh, systematic or programmatic approach, just, you know, here's somebody sitting across the table from us that we think we should work with, let's find a way to do it, and we did, and then, you know, over time we met, met others and, and continued to pursue that approach. Uh, now we've been doing it for about 10 years, uh, and we've learned a ton along the way. Uh, in the beginning, we had no special insight into what makes a great emerging manager. Um, or how to build a, an investment firm or anything like that. And, um, you know, we're still certainly not experts in that topic, but we've learned some things over the years that we thought, um, you know, it'd be great to, to find ways to communicate that and to, you know, share that knowledge that we've gained. Um, so you created a community or website, emergingmanagers.org. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah, we created a, um, a website a couple years ago uh, called emergingmanagers.org where we just started collecting some of the resources that we found helpful from, you know, things that, different people have spoken about on this topic and different resources, um, some of the you know, service providers that we know that emerging managers use and so on. Um, and a lot of it is, you know, we, we haven't been in the position of starting an investment firm, so there's a lot that we don't have the authority to speak on. Um, but, you know, anytime we find someone who's actually done this, like you or, or Dennis or others, you know, we want to collect those insights in one place so that there's sort of one place that people can go to. Uh, to find, you know, to learn more on that topic. Um, and so we've tried to make more and more resources public. Um, I think partly because we found that this business is not always the most meritocratic business, like the, the most passionate, uh, kind of most uh, deserving people who might actually be really good investors. You know, if they don't come from a background of, you know, being investors or they don't kind of land a great job right out of college you know, or so on uh, just is a bit harder for them. Um, and there's a lot that if they're not kind of in the inside of the community that they wouldn't necessarily know um, or have insight into. And so if we can make that public and um, help people understand that better, uh, you know, there's more, more people out there who can um, you know, do what they wanna do. Yeah, I think it's great what you're doing. The, the biggest um, challenge for a young manager who's been successfully managing their own money but would like to start a fund and, and start managing other people's money as well is getting the seed capital. Uh, I remember I described it as a kind of a chicken and an egg problem when I, when I was starting because um, in order to attract capital, you need to have a track record. Or a lot of people think you need a track record, but you can't build a track record without having any capital. So, you know, how do you get started? So um, what, what sort of solutions to that have you seen and which, which are some of the, the best ones? Yeah, I think it's a really interesting topic and it's a really tough one. And of course I sit here in the comfortable seat of never having to actually do that. Um, you know, never having started a fund and seen my checking account balance dwindling or, you know, taking hundreds of meetings with people who, you know, turn me down and so on. So I have a lot of humility about, about what I can really contribute to the topic, but uh, you know, we've certainly seen a lot of people try to do it. Um, I guess I see, you know, I see a lot of people, um, if they have a plan of starting a fund at some point, they start laying the groundwork long in advance. Um, and, you know, they don't just show up on people's doorsteps saying, hey, I just started a fund, you know, will you fund me? But they're, throughout their career, if this is the aim that they have in mind, they're trying to build relationships with people, you know, hopefully along the way they've impressed um, you know, mentors or bosses or people that they've worked with, you know, if they've done really high quality work, then um, likely they have people who have been impressed with them who would like to help them and feel like they, uh, they have that trust. Um, and, you know, we've seen people sort of build that uh, over a period of years, and, you know, start building relationships with, with people who have capital, um, you know, start introducing themselves to people long before they actually are in a position to start their fund. Uh, that's certainly one approach. Um, so kind of building and participating in an ecosystem. Yeah, yeah. And I think this event is a big con contributor to, to being able to do that, which is one of the best things about it, I think. Um, I, I guess the other thing that we've seen is, is um, you know, if you can get the costs really low, then the starting AUM that you, that you need is, is fairly low. And if you can get off the ground with sort of a minimum sustainable amount um, and cut every cost out that's not absolutely essential. Um, you know, you can give yourself the chance to build that track record and prove that you're a good investor and a good capital allocator. 
Um, and we've certainly seen people be very creative and, and things that they've done. I mean, you've written about, um, you know, traveling and sleeping on friends' couches and working from home before it was cool during COVID, um, you know, long before that, um, you know, uh, and so on. I, was, I, was, I, I saw this pandemic coming yes. more than 10 years ago, and I've been prepping since. <laughs> yes. Um, so we've certainly seen people do that, and we admire, you know, the scrappiness that people show and wanting to, um, you know, give themselves a chance and get the lowest cost structure that they can to, to get going. Um, so, you know, those are all things that you can do, but it, it clearly doesn't make it easy. Um, you know, it's still going to be a hard process, and so I think you have to be ready for it to be hard and have to be so passionate about wanting to do what you do that you kind of can't imagine doing something else because it's not going to be easy. Yeah. I really want to underline that point, and I think it's so important for people to hear that from, you know, one of the largest endowments in the world, that you're not looking for a large cost structure. In fact, it most likely puts you off. Yeah, for sure. We're, we're big believers in very simple operations. I mean, there's a wide variety of different ways to do it. You know, we, we also partner with people who have, um, you know, bigger teams and, and more operational setup in-house. And for some strategies and some people, that makes sense. But we're also very happy partners with some people where, you know, there's one, one owner, operator, you know, capital allocator, investor, PM, analyst, you know, it's all one person um, and everything operational is outsourced. Uh, that's perfectly fine with us. And, um, you know, for a really simple investment strategy, especially one like yours, that, that actually probably is optimal in a lot of cases. Um, and it, I think it creates, some people think of that as a, as a more fragile setup. I think we sort of think the opposite um, that the lower the cost base, you know, you don't have to worry about if this manager has one bad year or, if, you know, AUM is down a bit that they have this big cost structure or if they have one redemption, if they have, you know, uh, one unpredictable thing happens that all of a sudden they're in trouble, you know, the lower the cost base, the more margin of safety you have there. Yeah. So if a manager is fortunate enough to attract uh, sufficient capital to get started, the next question they need to ask themselves is structure. So obviously, I don't want to get into a discussion on different legal structures and different countries have their own systems, but at a very high level, what are the kind of things to think about when you're looking to put together a structure for, for a fund? Sure. I guess the first thing to say is maybe, maybe obvious, but it, I think the first thing to say is that it is really important. You know, the more time we've spent thinking about structures, the more we've appreciated how important that is in, in people's success. Um, you know, it really is worth spending a lot of time thinking about what is the ideal structure for what you're trying to accomplish? You know, what, what, in, what do you want to incentivize? What behaviors do we want in, to incentivize for the GP and for the, you know, LPs and everyone around the table? Um, you know, what's optimal and what's going to put you in the position to, you know, make the best investments that you can possibly make um, and do exactly what you need to do? Um, and so, you know, I think the people that we work with tend to spend a lot of time thinking about it and, and you know, not just... Um, you know, something they start thinking about right before they launch, but something they kind of contemplate for years. Um, but in some ways, it's deeply personal. You know, what, what structure makes the most sense? It, I don't think we found one that works for every case. You know, I think for you as the, as the portfolio manager and the GP, it needs to be something that really aligns with the way that you think um, and that you're, you know, really happy with and excited about. Um, and, um, you know, there's lots of different ways to do it, but kind of thinking about what makes the most sense to you. Um, you know, how do you incentivize the right behaviors? Uh, I think having the right LPs around the table, you know, really gets you a long part of the way there. Um, you know, having, having the right people who have the exact same goal that you have and, and are on the same mission that you are, uh, I think is a big part of it as well. Yeah. And I think it, seem, it sounds very simple and, and intuitive when you say building the structure, which is going to allow you to, to make the best investment decisions. But um, it's worth underlying that oftentimes um, that can be conflicting with the best structure for raising capital or for, for, for building a profile. So. Yeah, I think in many cases they can be the opposite. And maybe that's something to say about the chicken and the egg thing as well. One of the ironic, I guess, or interesting things about it is that the easier it is to raise capital, you know, the more generic your strategy might be. Um, you know, if it was really easy for you to raise capital, then it's probably easy for a lot of other people to raise capital to do exactly what you're doing. Um, and if it's really hard to raise capital, you know, again, easy to say from where I sit, but, you know, in the long term, that probably means you have a more differentiated strategy that's much harder to replicate. Um, and I think that's probably the case with structures as well. You know, almost by definition, some of the most interesting, best-aligned structures are things that people won't necessarily sign up for because they're a little bit 
unconventional and, and different from what people are used to. Yeah, it's such a powerful and counterintuitive idea to, to seek the structure which is least attractive to people. But it's, yeah. <laughs> it's, it's a powerful idea though. Any thoughts on the question of separately managed accounts versus fund? Um, any advice you'd give to people toying with those two different routes you can go down? Yeah, I think it's a, it's a little hard to generalize because every, you know, every jurisdiction is different, every person is different, every strategy is different, you know, every, every LP base is a bit different. Um, and we, we did a, um, a webinar with our operations team where they kind of talked more about just in general what those two structures look like, uh, and that's on, on, on our website. Um, I think a lot of people have kind of told us, so first, we're, we're fine with either. We, we're open to both. I think our goal is to partner with great people and you know find structures that work the best for us and for them. Uh, we like SMAs, but we also have fund investments as well. Uh, both can work. Um, I think we've heard from a lot of people and found that sometimes the initial cost can be a bit lower with SMAs. Uh, you don't have as much admin costs. You don't have necessarily uh, audit costs. Um, it also, I think, is easier for people to sign up with you on day one when it's an SMA structure where they kind of have control and visibility into what you're doing. It's a little bit less scary than signing up for, you know, a pool of capital where there's a GP that has, um, you know, a lot of power and, and um, you know, you don't have perfect transparency into exactly what they're doing. I mean, you can create that transparency in other ways, but sometimes an SMA structure can be a little bit easier to get started with. Um, on the other hand, you know, over time, you may not want, you know, hundreds of SMAs or dozens of SMAs. Uh, so a fund structure can make sense as well uh, to have, you know, all the people in one in one pool of capital or sometimes people end up with both, you know, one or two SMAs for larger partners and, and a fund for uh, for lots of individuals, um, but either one can work. Yeah. So uh, emerging manager, they have their seed capital, they have their structure. Maybe the next question they're asking themselves is about teams uh, and how many people uh, to operate with. Um, so you indicated you prefer lower, simple structures, lower costs. So I'm assuming the smaller the team, uh, the better. But of the, the successful ones you've seen who have built small teams, maybe you can describe what type of characteristics you've seen there and what, what type of decisions they've made. Sure. Yeah, I think um, you know one of the things that we've really learned is is you know we come back to this principle of alignment and i think you know people think about alignment a lot and talk about how important it is i think it it exists not just because uh, between you know the gp and the lp but across everyone in the organization and every service provider every employee every you know partner um i think you want to hire people who have the same vision as you and are really excited about um you know what you want to do i think one of the things we've seen people struggle with is um you know you might have the goal of of staying small and focusing on performance and, and turning down capital that you don't think is ideal. Um, but if you hire some, you know, an ambitious person earlier in their career who, um, you know, maybe they, they hear you say that, but they don't necessarily believe you. They think, well, you know, over time, they're gonna, they're gonna go raise money because they're gonna have the opportunity to, um, you know, the smaller the organization and the simpler, I think the easier it is to have a really unusual vision and, and the easier it is to actually stay small. And there's just, a bit less pressure to grow and, and to change and to become more conventional. Um, maybe that's one of the powerful things about being a one person operation is it's a little bit easier to keep that unconventional bent. The more you know, people you hire, maybe that gets a little bit harder. Um, but I think it certainly can be done. You just need to make sure that the people you hire are aligned with that. Um, or maybe they just want to work with you for a few years and uh, go on to do something else. But just making sure that, you know, the long term vision that they have aligns with, with yours. Um, and we've certainly seen, you know, one person shop operations work well, and we've seen, um, you know, teams work well as well. Yeah. What have been the defining characteristics of the teams that have uh, worked well? Hmm. Or to maybe be more precise, um, is it sort of hierarchical with one very clear person with the responsibility and people working with him, or is it more kind of collaborative? What, yeah, I think um, I think it can be both, um, and that's one of the interesting things, I guess, is we keep finding these people who do things differently. Like, there's not necessarily one way. We have managers who have made it work lots of different ways, um, and I'm trying to kind of think because a lot of the people that I personally work with are one-person shops or kind of very small organizations. Um, 
But I think we've seen people work with, you know, having an, an analyst. I think we tend to find that one ultimate decision maker tends to work best. Um, you know, the smaller the decision making group, the better. Um, but we've also, you know, again, we've seen exceptions to that. We've seen two person, uh, you know, portfolio manager teams work really well too. Probably not investment committees. Yeah, definitely not investment committees, but you know, two people who have known each other a long time and have the exact same vision and philosophy and but kind of bring two different things to the table. I think that can work well. Um, but, um, you know, I think it, it matters to, um, you know, the, what the strategy is. If, if you have higher turnover or a larger portfolio, having an analyst can be really valuable. Um, but I think, you know, having, I guess, having it clear in your mind, what is, what is it that the analyst team or analysts really bring to the table? Um, is it really, you know, what is the tangible value add that they bring? Is it doing extra research? Is it a different perspective? Um, you know, is it, um, you know, something, some, you know, different idea, someone to push back on, on what you think, um, you know, having some clear idea of, of what that is. Um, I guess with one person shops that we've seen, they, they still value that, but they often build a network of kind of like-minded investors who they can talk to about, you know, ideas and, and people can push back on them, but they don't necessarily need to employ those people. They actually prefer to have a peer. I think you might fall into that category. <laughs> yeah, I mean, um, what, what, one of the things I enjoy the most is, is you know, discussing ideas with my peers and, um, uh, you know, events like this one is a great way to, to expand that network. Um, now the, the tricky topic of marketing. Um, investors quite rightly don't like to see managers spending all their time marketing. They want to see them trying to make the portfolio more valuable. On the other hand, our young fund manager, um, you know, she probably wants to um, attract an MIT. So how do you get on the, how would, how would someone get on your radar uh, without spending their whole time uh, traveling around the world seeking, uh, seeking meetings with people? Yeah, I think, um, you know, you've written thoughtfully about this topic. Uh, you know, I think, um, you know, maybe marketing is the wrong framework, but kind of thinking over, over time, how do I build, you know, the LP base that I'm, I'm really happy with and that complements what I do? Um, I think, you know, it comes down to, you know, having a really low cost structure means that you don't have a gun to your head to go raise money, uh, you know, in the next six months, and you can take maybe a multi-year approach to building relationships with different people who might be a source of capital over time. Um, you know, I think we've found that really amazing investment content and investment research is still a rarity, even with all the things that are out there, and, and you know, writing really thoughtful um, content, whether it's, uh, you know, stock write-ups or just really good letters, like they tend to be found, even if you don't publish them anywhere. Um, you know, if it's really good and you're kind of contributing something to the conversation, people will read it and people will share it. And, um, you know, you can kind of build a community and a network that over time, you know, doesn't necessarily may directly lead to someone picking up the phone and calling you and saying, I want to invest a hundred million dollars. But, um, you know, over time, that'll lead to someone else that you meet that maybe they make an introduction that, you know, that will lead to something over time. Um, so kind of taking a holistic approach and thinking about over a period of years, how do I, um, you know, get the word out there a little bit about what I do? Um, you know, how can I show that I have some, you know, I deserve uh, to be able to, to manage more money? And, um, you know, how can I show that I'm, um, you know, qualified to do it? Um, so that would be part of it, I think. Yeah, and I, I know you guys are very, very diligent in you know searching under lots of stones and kissing lots of frogs to find the prince. And I'm, I'm sure anyone putting out good uh, good content out there at some point, uh, MIT is going to find them. Um, yeah, let me check uh, how we're doing time-wise. So should we turn it over to the audience for some I guess, questions? I guess the other thought of, on the marketing piece. Um, is I, I think, you know, I would underscore this idea that if you, you know, generate great returns, if you, you know, show that you're generating the great returns through, you know, a really thoughtful investment process with a lot of rigor, um, you know, over time, people will fund you, um, even if they're, um, you know, a bit hesitant up front, even, you know, unconventional setups become more appealing to people over time if, if the returns that are generated are amazing uh, yeah, that with, with near certainty that happens over time. You just need to give yourself enough runway and that comes back to what we, where we started the conversation of just keeping costs low. That's right. Yeah. 
Great. So um, over to you guys. Um, who'd like to ask the first question? Um, hi, Joe. It's Claudine from Spain. I have a slightly out-of-the-box uh, question. Um, as you meet so many managers or potential managers, why are there so few women <laughs> in doing this job? <laughs> That we can sure. See here. Yeah, I think um, you know there, that there's a big question there. It, it's like big industry-wide question of why there are um, you know so few women in this industry, um, which I think you know extends far beyond us. I think um, you know one of the reasons why we try to put out as much content as we do is to make um, you know, sort of try to open source the industry a little bit as much as we can and and not have our process of um, you know, finding managers and, and backing managers be something that happens behind closed doors, but kind of be very open about exactly what we do and you know, what the best managers that we work with do and, and how other people might be able to do that. Um, that's sort of the best so far that we've been able to, to come up with um, is to try to, to make accessible all the resources that you know, we've used and, and managers that we've known have used to get into the industry um, but I think, um, you know, we, um, it's hard for, uh, for us if we, if there's not, you know, a lot of women in the industry in our portfolio is, is going to mirror that to some extent. Um, you know, we can't have a, such a dramatically different pool than, than the industry has. So we think of it as kind of an industry wide issue. And, and I'm sure everyone in this room would have thoughts about how we might solve it. Um, you know, our solution so far has been to just try to be more open about what we do and, um, you know, share resources that'll be helpful for people breaking into the industry. Uh, we've even written a bit about that topic as well. Uh, I don't know if, Rob, if you have any, any thoughts on what we might be able to do better in general. Well, um, the, the single most uh, traumatic social media experience of my life was uh, about five years ago, there was a, a comment and I'm very fortunate the comments on my YouTube channel or, or everywhere else are generally very, very positive. And, uh, um, but there was a comment a few years ago um, along the lines of, you know, where are the women at your event? And um, my immediate reaction was, I'm not a sexist. You know, I you know, was like sort of, you know, you know, my immediate reaction was, was feeling angry. But then after I sort of had the chance to sort of uh, reflect on it a little bit, I thought, yeah, that's actually a very fair uh, comment. And... And I think there's lots of um, unconscious things that happen that make it more difficult for women uh, to uh, enter this industry. Um, you know, if I take this event here, you know, um, I simply just send out and, and uh, I put it up on my website and say, hey, you know, anyone can try and register. And, um, you know, but I think even, even something as simple and as apparently harmless as that, there's probably a greater propensity or a willingness for men to sort of get onto the plane and see a complete stranger on the other side of the world than, um, uh, than, than perhaps uh, for women to do that. So um, I think there's a lot we can do. Um, you know, since I saw that comment, I've always been very specific that although registration for this event is limited, if, um, if you're a, a woman or a uh, part of any other sort of ethnic group or other type of minority group who's generally underrepresented in the industry, you immediately get a free pass. Um, I also emphasize this event is a, is a family event. You've all seen my, my wife, my children are here. Other people bring their wives and children or partners. So it's a very safe environment. Um, it's a very friendly environment. And if there's uh, budding uh, female investors out there who are sort of on the fence, should I come, should I not come, then Hopefully, um, uh, they can hear my comments here, and, um, and we'll see more, more of you next year. But thanks for the question, Claudine. Hi, Alex from Italy. So when you sign up a manager, obviously you have an expectation on him, and then things don't work out as expected. So I wanted to assess your capacity to suffer. So what's your, the shortest period that you would part with a manager, and what was the longest record where you showed capacity to suffer? Sure, uh, great question. Um, so, you know, when we partner with managers, we take a long-term view and, and we try to have it really clear in our head why we're backing them, and it's not because of the last two years of performance. And so, 
you know, if we start the relationship and the first two years of performance are bad, then that, you know, that wasn't the reason to hire them. So that's not the reason to part ways. Um, so I don't think that we've ever had relationships that, you know, didn't last three, four, five years, um, just because it's such a short period of time in, in the grand scheme of things. Um, I, I don't know what the, you know, exact statistic is on, on the very shortest, but, um, you know, it's going to be a lot longer than a lot of relationships in the industry broadly. Um, as the longest, I mean, we have venture capital relationships that started in the 70s, um, you know, where we've been partners with the same firm for 30, 40 years. Um, you know, I think in a lot of ways, that's sort of the ideal is to find people that we can partner with who are doing something, you know, sustainable that works in a lot of different environments. And, you know, they can do it not just for five years and we get a great return, but they can really compound the capital for 10, 15, 20 years. Um, and if you do the math on that, it's just uh, really powerful to get that compounding. Even five, 10 years of extra compounding makes a huge difference. It's like that statistic that it, like a huge portion of Warren Buffett's wealth, like 99% came after he was 60 or something like that. Like if you do the math of the compounding, you know, if somebody compounds at 15% net, um, you know, if you stay an extra five years, then you get twice as much money from the relationship. You know, the, the, par the profits are twice as much. So uh, we really have a big focus on longevity and, um, there's all kinds of reasons why it's really hard to generate a 20-year track record, but we're really trying to select for the people who have a shot at it. Do you have managers that, that underperform for seven, eight years, nine years, and you're still with them? Um, hmm. <laughs> um, I think there, there might be one. It's sort of a stale example, and it was from before I joined, but um, there was a manager who... Um, focused on a specific sector, uh, and that sector had a really rough period of time. You know, they had they had generated great returns in the past, um, and then their sector kind of really struggled for a long period of time. Um, and you know, you sit there and, and look at that performance and think, you know, they haven't made us much money in a long period of time, but we really felt like the competitive advantages were still really strong, and we kind of understood why they wouldn't have done well, and and we have an appreciation for the fact that not every environment is ideal for every manager. You know, we want managers who will do okay in every environment and, um, you know, who will generate great returns through different market environments. But we understand that there are some strategies that go out of favor or sectors that go out of favor for a long period of time. So, um, yeah, I think there, there was one uh, a while ago, you know, seven or eight years of underperformance for a really great firm is, um, it's not super common, but it certainly does happen. And, and yeah, I believe there was one example of that. Great, there's a few hands up at the back there. Um, thanks for the talk. So um, what, what, how do you judge people? And what, what cues do you look for to get a sense if the manager are honest or thoughtful and so on? And also what traits you found to be the most successful fans? Um, like how the most, is, like what traits do the most successful managers like you found to have? What was the first question? How do we judge people? Like judge people. How do you judge them? And like, how does it differ from Zoom to in person, so on? Sure. Yeah, I think we tend to gravitate towards unconventional types generally who are um, just do things a bit differently. And there's lots of different ways that that can manifest itself. But, um, you know, they're not trying to copy necessarily what's worked for other people, but they're trying to do something unique to themselves that they have this idea of how one might generate great investment returns, you know, building on, on different things that have worked for people in the past, but they sort of come up with their own authentic approach, um, a willingness to do things differently and, you know, not copy necessarily what other people have done. Um, we spend a lot of time getting to know people. I mean, the, the Zoom world has made this a lot harder, but I think, you know, we'll definitely get back to traveling and meeting people in person. There's just no substitute for that. Um, and I think if you spend enough time with people, you start to see their real character and motivations come through. Um, and if you do that in a variety of different settings, you know, not just sitting across the table in a conference room, but visiting someone's house, um, you know, going for a swim in the lake with them, um, <laughs> you know, going out to dinner, uh, just seeing how they are in different environments, uh, you know, maybe taking a trip with them and seeing what happens when the train is running late and you're going to be late to a meeting. Are they, you know, losing their mind and um, yelling at people? Or are they totally cool? You know, are, how do they, um, you know, how do they act in a wide variety of different circumstances? And that sort of gives you a mosaic of 
what someone is really like and, and what their behaviors are, because I think you can hide your behavior in a, in a one hour meeting across a conference room table. You can sort of pretend to be something you're not, but over a period of months, you know, or a period of, of multiple days in a row traveling with someone in different environments, you really get a sense of what their behavior is like and what they would really be like as a partner. Um, and talking to lots of different people that they've worked with in the past, you know, between all of that work, it's, which is a lot, you know, it's very intensive and time consuming to do, but it's also very important to just really understand who you're getting into business with and whether there's someone you trust. Um, because there are so many ways that that can go wrong in this business if you work with someone you don't really trust uh, or your trust is misplaced. Um, so we put a lot of effort into that. Um, you know, I think there's, there's lots of traits that we look for. We tend to have a bias towards really unconventional types who are doing things differently. Um, you know, I think there's lots of different strategies and, and investments that we make. I think for public stock pickers, there's such a huge behavioral side to, to this game. Uh, it's so much easier to say, you know, we, we invest in eight companies and we hold them for the long term. Um, you know, it's easy to buy them and, and, and so on, but it's a lot harder to stick through, um, you know, when companies stumble or when, you know, the market decides they hate your companies for a period of time, um, you know, sticking through it and actually keeping that long time horizon is really difficult. Keeping that time horizon when there's crazy things going on in the world is really hard. Um, and I think we found that can be a huge differentiator for people who are really set up to do that, who have the temperament to do that. Uh, and who have been thoughtful about creating an environment around them that encourages long-term thinking, um, you know, across everything they do between the, the investor base and, you know, the physical environment that they're in, the city that they're in. I think all of those things contribute to keeping that long time horizon, keeping the ability to think independently and, and also not to get caught up in the noise. Those would be a couple of really important things. Sounds like living next to water is a very important uh, factor. Definitely. <laughs> But, but if Highly predictive. In, but if you're based in London, please don't take your investors to the Thames. <laughs> George, I think you had a question. Hi, hi, Joel. Joel, can I follow up on the topic of longevity? Um, can I ask what you've learned in terms of characteristics for those managers who are able to sustain a multi-decade track record for maybe others who are equally talented but just couldn't give you that long runway to compound? Sure. Yeah, it's a topic that we think a lot about. And, you know, it's striking just how few 20 plus year amazing track records there are. Um, and we've always been very curious and introspective about why that might be. Um, you know, I think, I think part of it is there's just so much pressure to conform over time. Um, so much pressure, even if you start out, you know, with a different vision, there's so much um, everyone expects you to evolve in a certain way and, and act like a big manager should. Um, you know, if you grow the scale of capital, you know, you feel like you should do the things that other big firms have. You should have, you know, a bigger team and you should, um, you know, have a diversified LP base and, and all these things that just kind of take you away from the unusual, unconventional things that got you started and built the first five or 10 years of track record. Um, I think that's a big part of it. Um, you know, if you if you do a good job and compound over the first 10 or 15 years, even if you don't raise a huge amount of money, the, the asset scale will grow a lot just by the beauty of compounding. Um, and so, you know, if you add to that, um, you know, being willing to raise a lot of money, you know, that the asset scale can grow quickly and that, um, you know, definitely hampers future returns. Um, you know, I think we also look for people who have motivations beyond just money. Um, I think money can be a powerful motivator and we have respect for the power that it has. Um, uh, but I think, you know, people who are at least have other motivations as well and, and really care about generating great returns and are willing to do things that go against the short term pocketbook for the, the ability to generate long term returns. Um, you know, we have a lot of uh, respect for that and an appreciation for that. Uh, but it almost takes a crazy person to do that, like to resist those pressures and to resist the desire to raise you know, larger amounts of money and build this great, you know, generational firm um, and do all the things that, that other people do when they, they grow big, you have to kind of be a little bit crazy to keep that unconventional bent and to keep focusing on returns. Um, and I think that just makes it a really rare thing um, for, you know, lots of different reasons. Yeah, those are a few thoughts there. Awesome. We've got time for one final question. Hi, I'm Florian from Hamburg. 
Um, just a question on your decision process. I suppose it's probably a quantitative process and a qualitative process, and you probably have a sort of a score card and some some numbers that you finally derive on on a manager. But I was wondering how much it is like a score, a quantitative approach to the, get the gut feeling you have on him to finally decide on. I think it's it's a very qualitative process. Um, I think there are quantitative things that that matter, but we don't spend you know a massive amount of time slicing and dicing a track record or numbers or anything like that. Um, you know, there aren't really statistics necessarily that tell us that someone's a great investor. I think it's more qualitative than that. Um, I don't necessarily think it's a it's a gut feeling either. I think there's um, you know a lot of reason and, and thinking that goes into it. Uh, but it tends to be a, a qualitative sense of, um, you know, what someone's trying to accomplish, how well they've set up their organization to accomplish those goals, you know, what are their real motivations, um, you know, how thoughtful is the research process, are there, you know, things that they, they say and do that strike us as kind of unusual and, and really interesting. Uh, it tends to be a very qualitative process that's just sitting across the table from someone or across Zoom, uh, you know, unfortunately, some of the time. Um, and getting a sense for what they're what they're doing, and um, you know how unusual it is, and and how that compares to all the other people that we've met, and whether they might have some some sort of a competitive advantage or, or an edge in doing it. We've got time for one more final question, Sophia. Do you want to take? Um, thank you. Um, I'm Sophia from Boston. Uh, my question, or Cambridge, actually. Um, my question is around um, how you underrate change. Like, how how common is it that um, the person that you're underwriting undergoes some type of some type of change, whether it's like an investment philosophy um, or any other characteristic that when you underwrote them that was super important. And and how kind how do you kind of deal with it when that when that instance happens? Thank you. Sure. Yeah, it's a really interesting question because I think you know the other reason why there aren't as many 25 year track records is because people often don't evolve. Um, you know, in a thoughtful way along with the, the market environment. And I think a lot of the best firms that we work with and that we've observed over time have evolved in some thoughtful way. Um, and I think that's probably part of why having a great LP base is really important because um, if you have LPs that take the view, you know, I hired you to invest in small companies or I hired you to invest in Europe or, you know, what have you, um, and suddenly you decide the best opportunity is not in, you know, German small cap companies, but maybe, you know, American tech companies, uh, maybe to use a, an example. Um, you know, that might be where the best opportunity is and where, you know, the most, you know, the best long-term returns are to be had. And so you want people to not feel constrained necessarily by what they've done in the past and to go where the best opportunities are and to evolve. But at the same time, um, you know, you have to monitor if people are doing something different from what you expected. You have to kind of do some some work and figure out if you like the direction that people are headed in. Um, and so you need, you know, LPs who don't put you in a box necessarily and who are open-minded and thoughtful about what evolution might happen. But yes, absolutely, we see people evolve over time. Great. Joel, this has been so much fun. Thank you so much for, for coming and uh, being such a great... Uh, participant in this event and helping so many people and yeah hope to see you back next year my pleasure thank you